Madeline, can I go ahead now? I wanted to welcome everybody to our meeting tonight with CNPS. On behalf of today's volunteer crew, I wanted to um, get started tonight and glad everyone is here. My name is Stephanie Morris and I am going to be your host tonight. And before we begin, I wanted to ask anybody who is new, if you are attending a CNPS meeting for the first time, I wanted to welcome you and invite you to put um, some information in the chat if you would like. You could let us know where you're from and you could let us know how you heard about tonight's program. And for newcomers, this meeting is organized by the California Native Plant Society. We're gonna be talking tonight about California native pollinators with Juanita Salisbury. And I wanted to share a little bit about the Native Plant Society. We are a nonprofit environmental organization and we were founded in 1965. We have about 10,000 members and 35 chapters in the state of California. We're spread all over the state and our chapter is the Santa Clara Valley chapter. We cover the Santa Clara Valley and the Southern San Mateo County. And our CNPS mission is to save California's native plants and habitats by bringing together science, education, conservation, and gardening to power the native plant movement. So tonight we have a team of people. We all work together. We switch, switch roles a little bit every month. And tonight's team is I am going to be hosting. We have Arvind Kumar as the Q&A monitor. He'll be taking questions and answers at the end of the talk. We have a YouTube monitor who will be posting questions from YouTube to our meeting so that we can answer those as part of the Q&A session. And that is Gladys Mercier. And then we have Madeline Morrow on tech. And then as mentioned, our featured speaker who I will introduce in a moment is going to be Juanita Salisbury. I wanted to invite everybody um, both new to this meeting and returning and those on YouTube as well to join CNPS if you haven't already. We welcome your support of this movement to conserve California's native plant diversity. Membership benefits are great. We have a journal um, called Fremontia and Flora. We have a Blazing Star chapter newsletter. We also offer discounts at supporting nurseries. Uh, it's usually 10%. And we're just a great group of really fun people who love to talk about plants and um, share share very, very collaborative we share a lot together so to join you can visit cnps.org slash join there are a few exciting upcoming events happening with our chapter we're going to have a talk called gardening for native bees on april 14th at 7 30 p.m with john kehoe another talk on april 21st at 7 30 which is going to be the flora of the san joaquin desert with ryan odell and then I'm going to present on May 5th at 7.30, uh, a talk on trails to gardens and celebrating local native plants. The events are all listed on our meetup, or our, excuse me, our website, which is cnps-scv.org. And they're announced weekly on our chapter news mailing list. We have, um, timely updates that you can get by joining our mailing list. And that is a CNPS dash SCV news mailing list. I have put the um, link there. You can email that to subscribe to our mailing list. Wanted to mention also about our chapter nursery. There are a number of very hardworking uh, volunteers for our chapter who have been keeping the nursery going all year, every year, um, including this rather tough last year. The nursery is open for sales and they have curbside pickup. It's very convenient. You can order right off the website. Uh, it will tell you what's available and you can place your order and then it will help you schedule a date for pickup. So our nursery can also be accessed from our main website, the cnps-scv.org. And then you'll type in the slash cnps-scv-nursery. And if you don't get all these links, you can go to the website and right at the top of the page are very clear directions and organi organization to get to these different places on our website. So please come shop at our nursery and support our um, conservation efforts through the purchases and get some great plans for your garden. So if you're enjoying our virtual events, you can also help us organize them. We need uh, QA monitors, YouTube monitors, um, and others to help out. 
there are some information there on who you can contact to if you'd like to join and help. That's uh, not necessary that you have a lot of experience. If you can basically operate a computer, we can train you and help you and you can become part of what we're doing. I've just started doing this online myself in January and it's been really enjoyable. So I highly recommend you join our team. We're a lot of fun. So while we are having our talk tonight, please keep your microphone on mute. And if you have questions, they're more than welcome. You can type those into the chat box at any time during the talk. And after the talk, our QA monitor will help uh, relay those questions to our speaker tonight. We expect to finish by nine o'clock tonight. And as we mentioned, the program is being simulcast on YouTube where it will also be available for later viewing. So you can check it out anytime and send links to others you may know. So tonight's program, we're extremely excited to welcome Juanita Salisbury. Um, she is a landscape architect, and she's here to share with us some fascinating details about native plant pollinators. Juanita will also share some information about how you can attract native pollinators to your garden. And she will share about some different public pollinator gardens that she has spearheaded in Palo Alto that you can go see. She is a licensed landscape architect. She grew up exploring wild spaces in California and Oregon. She started gardening at around age 13 and has been inspired by the beauty of gardens and nature ever since. With degrees in psychology, biopsychology and landscape architecture, Juanita has established her own design firm focused on ecologically friendly drought tolerant planting. So I am going to turn it over to Juanita now. I'm going to stop sharing so that she can start sharing her slides and we will welcome her to tonight's presentation. Thank you so much, Juanita. It's a pleasure, thank you. Let me just pull this up and start from beginning. Okay, um, thank you for that nice introduction, Stephanie. Um, I, as Stephanie mentioned, I uh, have a degree in landscape architecture as well as in psychology. And um, in psychology, my area of expertise was a study of ingestive behavior, eating and drinking. And really, I've now come full circle in terms of uh, combining the biological with the landscape design to really create a tasty buffet for pollinators. And what I spent a lot of time watching bugs eat things. Um, and um, in that regard, I also have uh, five pollinator gardens. We started with the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on our YouTube channel, Primrose Way. As I mentioned before, we do have five gardens here in Palo Alto, they're, and they're always open. They're on public land in Palo Alto. Five gardens, the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, the Gwinda Street Pollinator Garden, Hopkins Avenue, Arcadia Place, and Island Drive. And if you Google Pollinator Garden Palo Alto, uh, these pop up on Google Maps and pictures of those gardens are also there if you wanna do a virtual tour. So the overview of my talk tonight, I'm gonna to just briefly talk about our public gardens and then I'm going to talk about pollinators, of course, and what they need. Um, in the habitat, and then um, something higher level, which are the connectivity considerations in terms of habitat. And I try to liven up my slides with uh, photographs of the pollinators that frequent the gardens. Um, and on this slide is a, uh, looks to be a, a carter bee on uh, Phacelia bolanderi. So how did it all start? Um, in 2016, I went to the city of Palo Alto about this particular space here. This is Embarcadero Road in Palo Alto, and it's literally around the corner from my house. And out of my own selfish desire for wanting more garden space, I asked the Open Space and Parks Department if I could design and install a pollinator garden with California native plants. I offered to do everything. This is key designing, site preparation, fundraising, volunteer, volunteer coordination, installation, and maintenance. And I told them I'm a licensed landscape architect. I've done this before. I know what I'm doing. And they said, show us your plan. 
And um, this was the original plan that we started off with. And uh, with um, some review, we had a couple of changes, but then they said, go for it. And so we did. Um, I set up a GoFundMe site to get some initial funding, as well as using a Palo Alto Know Your Neighbor grant. And uh, there was donated mulch from the city, as well as some uh, boulders and logs that the city delivered to our site. And we had volunteers come out and uh, help plant over several weekends. The initial planting of 300 plants, we've added more since. Um, and then later the city of Palo Alto created signage for the garden. And this has photographs of various pollinators as well as Native Plant Society, of course, and, and the Xerxes Society. That's what this looked like um, in spring 2019. Uh, I just went out today to look at the Primrose Garden and it looks pretty nice. If you have you know, the poppies are in full bloom and it's almost a little Palo Alto super bloom. It's really pretty. Here's another view of the same garden, um, the cherry trees and bloom there. They're in bloom uh, right now. So let's talk about pollinators. Pollinators are the organisms that move pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part. This causes fertilization of the flower and you get seeds. The majority of pollinators are insects and the majority of pollinators are bees. Bees in California, we have 1600 species of native bees and they do most of the heavy lifting. Um, some other insects like butterflies, moths pollinate incidentally. A few animals such as hummingbirds, bats and so forth pollinate incidentally. So I'm going to be talking basically about bees. Um, and pollinators are important because of plants. 87% of our plants and 90% of all flowering plants require pollinators to set seed. And this is a key point I'd like to make is that plants in the environment reflect what pollinators are present. Whereas butterflies and moths, which reflect the plants that are present. So we're looking at a hierarchy of function here. And we need pollinators. Without them, 90% of plants on earth would disappear. And we know that speciation of plants occurs more rapidly with pollinators. If you have something moving around the genes, you're gonna get uh, speciation much more quickly. So pollinators, the function of bees is to spread genetic diversity of plants in the environment. They spread genes around. This is what they do. That is their function. That function then supports the diversity of floral and vegetative resources upon which other insects depend. Now, because of all these other insects, depending on what the bees are doing, spreading the genes around, this makes bees a keystone species. All the other insects and creatures wouldn't do as well without them. And how effective they are at spreading these genes around the environment depends on a number of different things. Their ability to carry pollen, of course, grooming habits, foraging behavior, body size and shape, tongue length, long versus short, and whether they, they are polylectic, they visit a variety of flowers at a time, although typically only one species at a time, or a specialist, oligolectic, visiting one or very few species of uh, flowers. So what's important? I'm all about function as a landscape architect. I always want to see how things function because my design imperative is form follows function. And so we need a pollinator habitat to help these native pollinators. Food, obviously, water and moisture, shelter and nesting sites. So how do you optimize all of those components to make your pollinator habitat as productive as possible? And when I say productive, I mean, how do you encourage reproductive success so you can have more and more bees? And the answer to that is you start with plants. 
And we start with plants because plants are literally the beginning of everything. And plants are the primary producers of food and the base of the food chain. So we have in the slide before I've changed a little bit, but energy from the sun is converted by plants in the leaves. And then that food is then eaten by insects and other animals like this big fat caterpillar. So essentially turning photons into protein that then is fed to other animals like baby birds. We need uh, fat larva to feed uh, baby birds. 37% of our animal species on the planet are plant eating insects. And as a rule, native insects will only eat the native. So pollinators then play this key role in the environment by making that sun's energy available to everything else by spreading the genetic diversity of those plants. So let's talk about food, those floral resources for bees, for pollen. Um, bees are vegetarians. They don't feed their offspring other insects for growing up. They feed their offspring pollen, and that is their sole source of protein. It's vary in their amounts of proteins between about two and a half to about 61% uh, per uh, percent of uh, protein. There's fats, starches, vitamins, and minerals, and the coating, the, the shell surrounding pollen is very stable and it can persist for thousands of years. And, and archaeology is actually very useful to determining what plants were present thousands or millions of years ago by finding these very tough structures of uh, pollen uh, shells. And not all, some bee species uh, can only live off of one type of pollen. Okay, so they vary in their ability to digest different pollens. If you try to raise bees on a non-host pollen, they won't live. Uh, pollen comes in a lot of different colors, and that color basically comes from this sticky coating that's on the outside of the shell with the pollen kit. And the pollen kit is made up of, of fat, um, car carotenoids, flavonoids, proteins, and some carbohydrates. That part is pretty digestible and is also attracts water. So when pollen floats off into the air um, with wind pollinated plants, it may act. So pollen carries the male genes of the plants. And uh, here we have a, uh, some nice pictures off to the side here, showing here on the side some plants that the uh, bumblebees like. Bumblebees are generalist, and so here we have bumblebees feeding on a variety of native plants. So the ability to carry pollen to be moving genes are able to transport it. Okay, females, most female bees are solitary. They are the only ones responsible for provisioning their nest. Um, some bees are social. We're not gonna talk about honeybees, those are not native. Um, bumblebees are social, semi-social. They have uh, a small temporary hive, but for the large, large part, for in large part, most bees are solitary. So you have one female provisioning her nest and she's not making a ton of baby bees. It's not like a hundred, it's more like, you know, like five to 25 or something like that. So not a whole lot, but um, the females then, arched hairs like this Melissoides here on this aster, um, and these specialized hairs are called scopa, and she can put pollen in there for transport. Other bees have a flattened area on the back leg um, that's called the corbicula. Um, other bees like this leaf cutter bee here has this, the uh, scopa on her abdomen. This is way to be able to tell the leaf cutter bee uh, because the abdomens are very distinctive. And so, um, The bees will fly to a flower and then fly back to the nest. And most bees, the smaller bees, their range is between the flower and the nest, only about 150 feet. Uh, larger bees can fly further. Um, some bumblebees can fly up to a mile, but generally about 1,500 feet between nests and flowers. So that means if you provide food, you will 
more than likely have bees nesting in your habitat, your front yard, your backyard, your side yard, wherever you have the goodies. So I love this particular picture. And as I mentioned before, the ability depends on how you groom it into your, your, your curbicula, your pollen basket. So here I have a picture of a bumblebee literally hanging with one leg off of a um, flower here. This is a, a Solanum xanti, which she just buzz pollinated. So she's showered in pollen. She's cleaning her antennae with one leg. Her two middle legs are grooming the pollen off of her midsection and out of her fur into her back legs, um, into these pollen. This to me is a multitask, and it's so much easier if you have six legs. Um, like I said, I spent a lot of time watching bees do their thing, and this was completely fascinating. They just they know how to do so much. So, um, as I mentioned before, I do watch bees eating. This is the this is the real meat and potatoes for me is to see them eat, and so here we have. Um, a small bee on Grindelia, and she is uh, going after the pollen. You can see her abdomen is curled under like this, and she's using her antennae to uh, touch and taste and smell um, the pollen, as well as then uh, gathering up in her scopa here, the, the pollen for transport back. So a lot of interesting sensory cables with antennae, kind of like a couple of giant tongues on the head. Here's another one, um, another native bee. She is gathering pollen from Salvia apiana, the white sage. And I can generally tell what bees are doing by what their mouth parts are doing. And so she's um, scraping off some pollen here for again, for transport back to the nest here using her forelegs and her mandibles then to uh, dislodge the pollen. Some other on native plants gathering up pollen. And um, our native coffee berry here, you wouldn't think that this would be so attractive, but these, even though these flowers are really small, we have some really tiny little bees. And so this one is uh, going after pollen here. This one on uh, Isocoma menziesii, this is a masked bee here. You can see she's going after the pollen there. Um, this leaf cutter bee, you can tell by the uh, abdomen there, also going after the pollen. And then this is also another mask on Delia. And all these plants work really well to attract these insects. One of the plants that should be in every, every garden is, are poppies. Um, poppies are buzz pollinated, so they're bumblebee magnets. And because honeybees can't buzz pollinate, that is they shake the flower at a certain frequency to loosen up the pollen from inside the, the stamen so that it's released through the pores in the stamen. Um, they kind of rely on whatever's left at the bottom of the, uh, the basket of the flower there. But you can see a pretty good job there. She has a nice big load there of, of pollen to take back to the nest. I also like poppies because they're also larval food for uh, one of our uh, native moths, uh, Neoterpes edwardsata. Um, again, more pollen resources, Clarkia amoena, which is one of our native annuals. Also pollen provides pollen for pollen specialist. So it's good to include those. Um, Leptosiphon and this Postal poppy, there's a bumblebee down, this looks like an anthrophorbi, and a couple of beetles taking advantage of the plethora of pollen that uh, these flowers provide. And even though monardella is a great nectar plant, it's also wonderful for uh, pollen as well. Now we talked about the protein side, let's talk about sugar. Um, the other floral resource that uh, bees like from our native plants uh, is nectar nectar uh, and uh, moisture that these uh, flowers provide. So nectar, the sugar water, um, is a source of things like sucrose, glucose, fructose, maltose, various different kinds of sugars in varying proportions and various concentrations. 
Some nectars are really viscous, some are very watery, depends on flower structure basically. Um, the proportions and the presence of each type of sugar depends on the type of flower and it varies uh, during the day as well. And nectar is important to consider because lots of different reasons, but um, the less concentrated nectar that's um, maybe not as viscous or th thick is much easier for those long tongued bees to drink up. Remember I said that one of the important things about uh, what, what bees pollinate flowers depends on a long tongue, which is kind of like a straw. And if you've ever tried to suck up a milkshake, a nice thick one through a tiny straw, it's very difficult. But if it's all watery and melted, it's much easier. So that's something to consider. Um, you find that nectar secretion will increase during pollinator visits and then declines after pollination and is frequently reabsorbed into the plant. And then the flower structure, so tubular flowers, um, are like nectar humidors. They preserve the viscosity. It doesn't allow the nectar to evaporate and concentrate as much. Uh, the flowers also provide resins and oils. And some of these use these to waterproof those brood cells, okay? Um, some of them mix and carry back on their uh, corbicula. And some of those resins and some of those oils uh, have antimicrobial properties as well. So we don't know what all those are, um, but it's always good to provide a big variety of flowers so that you can uh, you can provide some of these substances for those species that will need them. And here we have uh, a great plant in, on the side here, Monardella villosa. Um, great, great nectar plant. You can see it's very, Hi, Juanita. This is Stephanie. Sorry to interrupt. I think we lost your video or audio. Oops, did we lose her entirely? Looks like we did. I think we lost her entirely. Oh. That's unfortunate. Let me see if I can connect with her. I don't think we've had this glitch before yet in a meeting, have we? No, she's here. Oh, she's here. Or she she's just came gone. back. Oh, okay. Let's give it a minute then. Maybe she can reestablish a connection. That was very really exciting. Juanita's back. We lost you there. Are you able to hear us, Juanita? We need some interim music. Juanita, I'm going to suggest if you manage to reconnect that maybe you consider turning off your video. Sometimes when you have connection problems, if you turn off your video, it's helpful because you still appear to be frozen see from our point of view.
Bonita, can you hear us? Well, we'll give it another minute or so. I'm going to see if I can find a way to contact her separately from the Zoom meeting. This is Stephanie. While we're waiting, this is Vivian. I'm uh, the chapter president, but I also wanted to mention something that I put in the Zoom chat. And so right now through the end of June, if you're new to CNPS and you want to become a member, I strongly recommend signing up for our, either our Going Native Garden Tour, which is totally free and a wonderful way to see plants and gardens and get ideas and, recommend, and uh, advice. Uh, at gngt.org or get a plant from us on our nursery and you will get a discount to become a CNPS member at 40% off for the, your first year. So if you are not currently a member and you've been thinking about it, consider doing that. And oh, Juanita's back. Yay. <laughs> Juanita, I was going to suggest when sometimes when you're having issues with internet, if you turn off your video, it, it lessens the demand on your um, channel. Yes. Um, okay, let me. Uh... And did you come out and come back in again? Yeah, no, yeah. So why don't you try that? You should still be able to share your screen. Okay. Uh, let me try something here. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you're not seeing my screen? Not yet. Not quite okay. yet. Yeah. All right. It might be because I'm not a, you might have to make me a host again because I don't have the uh, pop up on the bottom for this. Oh, weird. It says co host for me that you are a co host. Yes. All right. Uh, let me see here. Hmm. Um, so the share screen button is not available. It does not appear to be. I'm going to, I'm just going to take away co-host and give it back to you. See if that makes a difference. Okay. Oh, there it is. All right. Share screen. Now we're... Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. Yeah. I just made you a co-host again, so it should work. Okay. Very good. Don't you just love the internet? All right. So where were we? Oh, yes. We were here. Uh, so from this current slide, okay, so let's continue. Um, Would you like to try turning your video off to see if it helps? Or do you wanna try it this way and we can keep you posted? So I'm, I turned my video off, that definitely will help, I think. Okay. Yeah, it's, it was so nice to watch you. That was kind of uh, <laughs> hard, hard to make the call, but let's see if this works better. Yeah, I know. I, I love being able for people to see me because yeah. I'm just here, but oh well. Okay, so we were done with this slide and I was making the point that uh, nectar is the fuel for flight and other behaviors in the ecosystem. And this next slide um, is actually a video. And I took this in my home garden and I've got a Bombus Vosnesinski eye and you can hear my neighbors hammering in the distance because they're doing construction. Um, this one is nectaring on Circium occidentale, variety occidentale, which is a huge nectar producer in the environment. Um, if you have room for some thistles, plant them up because um, really there's just nothing better than, uh, than some nectar from a thistle. Right. Um, other plants that are super great 
uh, are asters, for, both for pollen and nectars. Um, asters are good to include in gardens, even though they spread by runners, they can be really uh, thug-like if they're happy and take over, but um, they provide pollen for specialist bees as well as for generalist species. So in general, you want to plant for the specialists as much as possible. And here we have um, another Melissoides. You can always tell by these puffy black back legs, these bloomers here. She's uh, nectaring on, on a flower, another leaf cutter bee down here, bumblebee over here. And I'm not quite sure what this one is. Um, another great plant. Um, this is probably a, some kind of a digger bee. Um, she is drinking nectar from Helianthus californica while also being coated in pollen. Uh, a great plant uh, for the native garden because it uh, it's a late bloomer, has abundant blooms, and is a likely larval food source for 31 species of butterflies and moths. Great plant. And it has a gigantic tuber for a root, so stores a lot of carbon underground. Um, Arctostaphylus and lupins for nectar. Once again, tubular flowers help prevent nectar evaporation and preserve nectar viscosity. Here you can see a nice uh, Bombus bosnesensky eye having a drink, as well as a beautiful blue orchard bee here. Um, and you can, like I said before, I can almost always tell what my, uh, my insect friends are doing by what their mouths are doing. So with the mouth parts extended like this, you can always tell they're going for the nectar. Penstemons, another great plant for nectar. Here we have uh, bumblebee, bumblebee vosnesenskii uh, going in. And uh, this looks to be maybe another blue orchard bee going in as well. Uh, great nectar sources for native bees. Uh, bumblebees seem to be all over the phacelias these days. And the phacelia tanacetifolia right now is in full bloom. Uh, a great nectar source in the environment and also provides pollen. You can see this female's got some big fat pollen baskets here with that blue pollen. Um, this is Phacelia tanacetifolia here. This is Phacelia californica. And uh, this is not a bumblebee. This looks to be another leaf cutter, but also going after the nectar. Another great species for nectar and pollen. Here we have leaf cutter. Uh, you can tell there's that abdomen again on a Ridgeron. Uh, I'm not sure what this species is, but again, going for both uh, pollen and nectar, as well as this one as well. Now, um, in terms of food for, for these bees, consider the temporal patterns of foraging. What do I mean by that? I mean, over time, what do you want to provide? So over the entire season, you're your plant palette should include at least three species each in the early, mid, and late bloom time. So at least nine species minimum because pollinators emerge at different times during the year. And then if you provide the overlapping bloom times, you'll keep them foraging in the garden. We have bees that come out as early as January and activity continues well into November. So you wanna to continue to have uh, at least three things blooming at any one time for a variety of pollinators. And over the course of a day, you want to include plants that bloom early in the morning. Some bees like to get their business done early in the day um, and some come out during low light conditions. So plants that bloom early in the day as well as at night. Some plants are pollinated at night by moths. Um, you know, some people say, well, I don't see any pollinators on this plant, but it seems to set seed, but that might be because it's happening during the night. Um, but in general, if you provide a diversity of blooms and plant resources, you're going to attract a diversity of these pollinators to your garden and other insects. Um, some studies indicate a garden with at least 20 different types of blooming plants is ideal for attracting a diversity of pollinators. Um, other studies indicate between 60 and 80 species is even better. And so one of our backbone shrubs that we like to put in all the gardens is uh, Areogonum fasciculatum, the, one of the California buckwheats. You can see there's a variety of, of uh, pollinators on it, um, both bees, there's beetles, um, you have little skippers, gray hair streaks who actually lay eggs on it. 
So um, great plant just uh, really provides a lot of food for a lot of different species. Again, bring out your early blooming plants. One of our great native pollinators here in Palo Alto that we have that come out in January are Bombus melanopigus, the black-tailed bumblebee. You can tell she's got this little um, tail here on her, on her, on her, on her butt. <laughs> and she's flying into one of my favorite plants I like to use in gardens because it blooms super early, which is Ceanothus valley violet, which one of, it's one of the first blooming Ceanothuses that we have um, in our gardens. Again, we have a, a Bombus melanopigus on uh, the valley violet here. And one of the great things about bees is that they carry a static charge, which is opposite to the charge that flowers have. So pollen will jump from the flowers onto the bees. So, um, you know, it's like a little static charge and then she'll groom this pollen off of her fur into her uh, corbicula there so she can take that back to the, uh, to the nest. So again, consider your, uh, your, your plants for, your, for your, 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 your native bees. And so here I have a beautiful, oh, just a gorgeous, um, what appears to be a what appears to be a metallic green sweat bee. Um, but what we want to do when we're planting is to um, plant in masses of a single species. And why is that? Bees generally will forage at one type of flower at a time. They will check out every single flower of a single penstemon, and then they'll go to the next penstemon and the next penstemon and the next penstemon over and over and over. And to really provide enough to keep them going, you want a big mass of a single species, at least three feet or more in diameter. That makes it so much more efficient for them to forage than having to go 10 feet here, 10 feet there. If they're in a big mass and they only fly a few inches to get what they need. And it's good because remember I said that these bees are solitary for the most part. And so the females have to provision their cells, their brood cells for their babies. And uh, they don't make a ton of bees in a season, okay? They some make, you know, maybe 10 or 12 or whatever it is. Um, and some studies indicate uh, there is 85% of 41 different bee species requiring all the pollen from more than 30 flowers to make one larva. And then other species required all the pollen from over a thousand flowers. So more is better um, if you want a lot of bees. And because about 70% of our bees nest underground, you wanna leave some bare dirt um, for them to, to crawl in underground and make um, their nests. So pro tip, provide abundance. Um, you know, here's my psychology background coming in. Again, consider the visual capabilities. What are the bees actually seeing? What are the clues that they're using to find what they need? Um, in general, um, bees think blue and purple equals nectar, okay? And blue is preferred amongst colors for flowers. White and yellow equal pollen. Um, and again, sunflowers have patterns in the ultraviolet that we can't see, but those patterns, some that we see and some that we can't see are nectar guides and those help find bees, uh, help their bees find their way to those nectar rewards and so they can carry on their uh, pollinating behavior. And here we have uh, Bombus vosnesenskii heading over to uh, Carpinteria californica in my home garden. Wonderful plant for pollen. So I, I wrapped everything all together in what, in that what I have as a divine sketch of, of all habitat goodies here. Um, and this is an imaginary thing. And so we're looking down at a plan. Um, this is a house here, a residence, um, where everybody has put blackout shades on all their windows to reduce light pollution. And then in the backyard, we have a gazebo and some vegetable beds. But the rest of it, um, we have some downspouts that enter into swales to collect moisture. That was one of those habitat things that we need. We have a big keystone species here in Oak, and we have very little pavement other than the patio. Again, because we want bees to nest in the ground. Um, and 
when I design gardens, I like to think about the gardens as a salad bar, a buffet. And um, I consider the behavior of the bees in the environment. And what I see bees doing is this trap lining behavior. Males especially will do that when they patrol a site. They will go from resource to resource to resource to resource to resource and back around over and over again. This becomes their patrolling area. But this trap lining behavior goes from different kinds of plants and they don't really vary these routes very much. But what they're doing is they're looking for females, okay? So consider things in masses like this and consider edges too. Edges are visual cues for insects who don't have a lot of neurons, a lot of brain cells. So you wanna make it as easy as possible for them. Um, you wanna plant at all scales. You wanna give small plants a place. You wanna give large plants a place, but start with the large stuff first. It's easier to get in at, before you plant in small stuff. You don't have to move the small stuff to, to add something big. Once you get the big stuff in, then you can add your shrubs, then increase complexity and nutrients with smaller plants like vines, ground covers, geophytes, succulents, and so forth. Outdoor lights, put them on motion sensors. And uh, because light pollution is a bad thing at night, it can really mess up a lot of insect behavior. So uh, blackout fabric is super cheap by the yard. You can just tack it underneath your curtains and make your yard as dark as possible. Um, the way I envision a habitat is I consider the entire lifespan and really trying to think of things as a very interconnected web. And I modified what the Calscape picture is that shows uh, water sharing amongst plants, but it's a good um, example of like how a larger tree with a taproot pulls up moisture from the ground and forms half of the rain cycle out here. But we also trap moisture, which is one of our habitat components, underneath rocks and underneath leaf piles. And um, what you find is that plants that spread by runners will move towards leaf piles where there's moisture. If you have room for a swale, this can help recharge the groundwater as well. And uh, things like grasses have these deep root systems that can also channel water down. I like to Think of things then connecting through the vertical as well as the horizontal. Another vertical example is to have vines grow up through shrubs and then everything starts to connect and share uh, nutrients and information uh, underground. Plants actually talk to each other um, via their roots. So here's a planting inspiration um, that I noted at Pinnacles National Park. Uh, which Pinnacles, if you haven't been, I would highly recommend going, has the highest diversity of native bees in all of California. And here we have a geophyte, Diclostema, with delphiniums growing together. Notice the color. Okay, so these things are growing together in a mass. So not really surprising that these are there considering the, the bees that uh, live in Pinnacles. People say, okay, Juanita, what do I plant? And so again, California Native Plant Society, you guys, we have the best information that you can possibly imagine. Um, a great free resource um, is this great database, the calscape.org database, and showing that we have so many native plants, almost 8,000, uh, broken down by all plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, and so forth. And you can search by location. Um, I just have California there. Um, and then lots of good resources up here. The planting guide is great. Tells you everything that you need to know about putting in those native babies and where you can find these plants. And then I'll talk about the butterflies in a second because for me, it's all about the mealtime. So my question is, instead of what to plant, my question is, who do you feed? Okay. Remember plants are food. And so, and plants need insects, pollinators to survive. And we know that speciation occurs more rapidly with pollinators. And pollinators, as I've said before, help spread species for butterfly and plant 
uh, or moth, moth larva. So the way to decide is to rank your plants by the number of species that use those plants. Okay, so if you can get a plant species that feeds 50 uh, different larva versus something that feeds three, I would go with something that feeds more. Okay, and what this all tells us is that the biological factors are more important considerations than non biological factors like climate, geology, water, and so forth in terms of determining what to plant. So another great resource in terms of what to plant specifically for bees and other insects of the San Francisco Bay Area region here um, was put together by Jeffrey Caldwell and it's 222 pages. He'll email you a copy if you're interested, but you can also find this great resource um, on various Facebook pages here, Insect Sciences Museum of California, Biota California, Flora and Fauna of California, and also uh, the CNPS. But it talks about uh, different species and then the native bees that you find on those particular species, as well as what are uh, plants for specialist bees. So plant for the specialists and the generalists will, will eat happily there as well great resource. Um, you know, why California native plants? Well, we want to feed our native bees. Um, and California is a biodiversity hotspot, one of about 30 some in the entire world. And we have uh, 1600 species of those native bees here, 4000 across the US, um, more than any other state in the United States. And we have so many huge plant species largely because of two things, our unique ecosystems in California, everything from beach, coastal chaparral to redwood forest to deserts and so on and so forth, and our 1600 species of native bees. Remember, bees help move the genes around in the environment. So they are directly responsible for what you see in the environment. Um, start with your keystone plant genera, and those are the plants that feed the most species. Um, they form the backbone of those resources, food, shelter, nesting sites, and keystone plants also help other plants to stay alive. And you want to include at least a few when you're planting up your habitat. Here we got a couple of cute little oak seedlings in my home garden there. Um, what to plant again? Um, start with your big keystone trees and shrubs to start with, then your perennials, your bulbs, your vines, your succulents. Um, choose the species that provide the most resources, um, vegetative for larvae, nectar and pollen for those uh, pollinators. And probably no more important keystone species than the oak, not just for the sheer number of species that it supports, but all of the ecosystem services it provides. If you don't have room for something this big, there's my six foot three inch tall husband here, grow one in a pot. You can get Cricus berberitifolia in a pot um, if you don't have room for something like this in the backyard. Again, why California native plants? Um, they're adapted to live here. They've done that for millennia. Um, and the native plants are preferred largely over non-native plants by pollinators. Um, and those plants provide those resources, nutrients, and things like that, that are necessary for reproduction and growth hormones and whatnot. Um, those native plants de depend largely on native pollinators for reproduction. Remember, honeybees can't buzz pollinate, so the plants that are buzz pollinated aren't going to be helped by honeybees. And uh, native plants, again, then provide the right nutrients for native plant uh, native insect larval development. Um, so many ecosystem services are provided by native plants. Um, here's one of our gardens, the Gwinda Garden, uh, that we started in 2018. Um, there's a big valley oak at the back and ivy, dead trees here. Uh, I don't know what garbage plants these are, but an eyesore, definitely. This is on Embarcadero Road. Um, I, the city asked me to design something here, and I did. We put up a little sign. Um, they removed the ivy, repaired the irrigation, and here was the garden after. What a difference two years makes. This garden looks great right now um, and just keeps getting more and more resilient over time as the plants settle in. 
the plants all help each other. Um, we planted some heteromeles in front of the oak instead we took these shrubs out and I would bet anything that the oak is having some discussions with those uh, toyons and helping them thrive. They're just huge. Okay, another thing, why California native plants? Again, um, so if you have gardens with native plants, those, those gardens then will encourage other native plants to colonize. Um, and again, plants are in the landscape are a function of the pollinator, pollinate, pollinators that are present. So here at the Primrose Garden, we have Epilobium ciliatum that just seeded itself in there. And here is the pollinator that spreads it. This is uh, probably Anthrophora here. You can see the mouth part here almost exactly matches the flower shape. So, you know, the, the whole point of these pollinators spreading these plants is nicely made by that particular cute little bee there. If you want to spread genetic diversity, um, an easy way to go is to use annuals. Annuals are great to provide a huge variety of floral resources. They're the most under threat natives from competition from non-native grasses. And there's a huge variety not typically available in nurseries. So as a matter of pride, um, if you want something unusual that nobody else has, that's a, a good way to go. Super easy um, for the most part, I think. Um, they can reseed in place. You can grow lower, uh, growing ones under taller shrubs. You can grow them in pots. Three easy ones that we like, poppies, gilia capitata, and phasalia tabaceofolia. Shelter. This is another habitat thing. So um, nest boxes, a lot of people like them. One of the things that you don't want to do is cluster a bunch of nest boxes together because that makes it easy for the cuckoo bees and predators to find. Um, and so here's a nest box that I have um, in my own backyard, and it was um, used by a mason bee. And um, I cleaned it out and took out the cocoons here and gave them a nice 10% uh, bleach rinse to kill the pollen mites. Um, but this box will be used again. I cleaned it out and everything, but it has these great um, windows for observation. Um, and I put these cocoons back into the top part so they can come out whenever they want. Again, um, complexity in the habitat provides nesting and shelter. The more complex your habitat is, the more resilient it will be. And you get complexity by increasing the number of plant species, but you can also get complexity by adding things to it, like logs, which are a great uh, place for insects to shelter. Um, this is a pile of logs that we have at the Gwinda Street Garden. And I use a lot of bamboo stakes in my own garden. And I was surprised one day to see this leaf cutter bee come out um, and she's nesting there. And now I know um, that bees will find any little spot they can to uh, nest. And um, now I have to be very careful and uh, not just throw out these uh, bamboo stakes at the end of the season because I know that there are nest cells in there. Um, along with that, this has really shaped my pruning decisions. Um, we know that a number of these native species nest in hollow stems and they usually nest from the bottom up, maybe seven or eight cells. And so you want to leave about the last foot or so if you're pruning it down. Um, here we have a, a native wasp going into the uh, the, the stem of a hummingbird sage that we deadheaded. Um, we usually just pile the stems up nearby and uh, not compost them. But male bees, um, you might wonder, well, well, the females have a place that they can go at night into their nest, but what about uh, the male bees? Well, male bees sleep in flowers or sometimes they hang on to stems, old stems like this with their mandibles for taking a little break here. Um, as we have this uh, male digger bee here um, having a nice little nap. That's how I was able to get his picture because he was asleep. So I was able to sneak up on him. Uh, and the Xerces Society has a lot of great resources. Um, the, the female uh, bumblebee, she's what's left after a season, she will actually overwinter under leaf piles 
This is why I tell people leave your leaves, especially those oak leaves, because those are a happy, fun site for these, these ladies to hang out until she establishes a new colony. Um, so leave the leaves. Um, they encourage fungal decomposition um, and fungus in the soil, which is a good thing. Um, you can have a couple of inches there and you'll have all kinds of other insects eating those leaves. Um, and leaves really are ecosystem gold. They help prevent weeds. They absorb water like a sponge. They filter water. They hold in soil moisture. They insulate the soil to keep the soil cool. And it's just easier to leave them. You don't have to get all hyper about removing them. Um, and plants will grow up through them. So um, I leave them because I'm not just lazy, but I, I love the complexity that they bring. Um, bare soil is important. So in places where you have some bare soil, you'll have nests. And these are over uh, at the Island Drive Garden. We have a nice little, um, these are probably helictids uh, nesting there. In this, and this colony has been pretty stable over the last few years. And I see these bees um, feeding on what's in the garden. I don't see them um, at the houses that surround this garden where there are few, if any, native plants really. So we have these gardens. How do we help these beautiful um, pollinators that we have? We have so many great native bees here in Palo Alto. Let's talk for a second about corridors. And this is where we take our gardens to the next level. And a corridor, it's defined as um, a linear habitat that connects two or more larger blocks of habitats. And they can take a few different forms, um, whether like a little necklace or a spider with um, a radiating uh, form here or a loop. Why are they important? Okay, remember what I said about bees moving genes around the environment. If these gardens are isolated, these bees aren't gonna be able to move the, the genes around so easily. So when you have isolated population, that leads to lower genetic diversity and that place the, places those species and populations at risk for extinction. If you connect those areas, then you have gene flow between habitats and you enhance the chances of colonizations of new plant species. And those effects increase over time. This has been scientifically shown that uh, plant diversity increases over decades in these native plant corridors. And what's moving these species around are bees. Um, and you have the flower patches then that are connected by corridors showing imp increased pollen flow between areas. Okay, so the tip here is use plants grown from seed rather than cuttings to promote gene flow. So by connecting these uh, gardens, you can really help those native bees um, that are struggling with habitat fragmentation and isolation. And what I not just put my money where my mouth is, I'm actually doing it here. So this is a, a view of Embarcadero Road. Here's the Primrose Garden here the Gwenda Street Garden, this is about a quarter mile, and we are connecting these gardens along the planting areas between the sidewalk and the street. We finished this area just recently, and we're starting down at this area next to the Primrose Garden we just started. This is the first congregational church here, and we're slowly working our way uh, down. And so this area here is this part, and then this is down at the church. So we have another big project to connect things. Um, and the city of Palo Alto actually has uh, a mandate in their master planning for parks to create uh, pollinator corridors. This is something that the population here, the, the citizens have asked for, and we are making it happen. So, you know, one of the things that I, I have just this one last slide after this one, but I want to talk quickly about avoiding an ecological trap. It's not enough to plant native plants. You might think, okay, I planted native plants, I'm done. Well, what you've done is you've set a buffet table out and you want to avoid a trap, which is basically something in the environment that will lure organisms into that habitat and that habitat is not fit to maintain them. So for example, outdoor lights, here's a moth hanging out on a window we can lose up to, I think it was 30% of insects at night 
um, through predation and exhaustion because these will fly out a window and other things will eat them before they can reproduce. So you don't want your garden to be a trap. So what, it, what you can do to prevent your gardens becoming a trap is connect those habitats via corridors, reducing that outdoor light pollution at night. This is a huge one, leaving the leaves. Um, a lot of insects spend their time as larva or pupa. Um, the adult lifespan is actually pretty short. Uh, you can spend months or years as a larva or a pupa. And if you're using leaf blowers around plantings, you're going to be killing those insects, removing them, desiccating them. And I probably shouldn't have to say this, but don't use pesticides. Don't use herbicides or fungicides. These things get into the soil where 70% of native bee species nest. And that uh, may negatively affect their uh, reproduction and their growth. And you also want to try to reduce air pollution as much as possible because bees use the scents, the fragrances of flowers to find resources. And so if things smell like gas blowers, leaf blowers, um, gas blowers, gas powered leaf blowers, uh, lawn mowers, you know what I'm saying here. Um, they're not going to be able to smell things as well. It's going to be very confusing for them. You want to make it as easy as possible. So with that, <laughs> my final thoughts here. Um, among the other ecosystem services native plants provide, other than bringing in these beautiful creatures that do marvelous things like hang with one leg and groom with five, um, the more that you understand these interrelationships, you'll understand how to optimize the productivity of native plant habitats. And that I think will lead to the enhancement of your appreciation as well as your role in nature's complex beauty. And with that, I'm back. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, you're back. Thank you so much, Juanita. That was fantastic. And yeah, the second part went incredibly smoothly. So even though we didn't get to see you, we heard you crisply and clearly, so that was fantastic. Um, I, I think it was really fascinating how you talked about pollinators influencing what grows in gardens. I really appreciate that input and the, the pictures in your talk were phenomenal. So, wow, <laughs> it was just so much fun to see those close-up flowers and close-up uh, pictures of all the different bee species. So, amazing, thank you. I am going to turn it over to Arvind, who can help us with reading off some questions from the chat tonight for you. Okay, Juanita, you ready? Yes. <laughs> First question from Mike Ross. How do the bees find my garden if the range is only 150 to 1500 feet? Well, I have a saying, if you plant it, they will come. Um, I mean, it's food. And so, um, you know, food is the great motivator of all animals. Um, I would say, uh, try planting something that's very fragrant um, because if they're too far to see a, a flower, um, if they smell it, that will help them find it more easily. Um, and so fragrant things like um, Salvia apiana um, Verbena, Lilacina, Delamina, which is another great fragrant one. Those two plants, unbelievable fragrance. You can smell them from a very long distance away, and that will help uh, pollinators, bees, find your, find your goodies. They will find it. They're, I mean, you cannot keep the bugs out. Once you plant these plants, they are going to be all over those things. Thank you. Um, Gladness was wondering if the bees have not found her flowers yet. So if, if someone is growing plants for the first time and they don't notice much insect activity, have they failed or yeah. <laughs> so, should they wait? Well, always wait. Um, things don't show up right away. Uh, one thing that you can determine that insects are finding your, your goodies that you're leaving out for them um, is are those plants setting seed? If they're setting seed, then you, you might have things coming early in the morning or during low light hours. Um, some bees will, will forage you know, early and late, others at midday. Um, 
if you if you wait and see if those plants are setting seed, then you know that they're being visited. Thank you. Um, actually, Gladys's comment was longer. I kind of abbreviated it, but it was that she has tons of native wildflowers blooming in the yard, but no pollinators. So she's wondering if it's because it's the first year. It may be. Um, I would say, you know, wait and see if those things are setting seed. You know, are the blooms fading? Because that means they've been pollinated. Um, you know, some people say, oh, the flowers don't last very long. Well, that's good um, because that means they're very attractive. Um, you could, one of the, the plants that I like to try to, to really attract things to the gardens are um, Phacelia tanacetifolia, which is a magnet. And also the Circium species, the thistle seed species are gigantic magnets as well. And, and again, fragrant flowers too. They will find it, things are setting seed, um, you know, just wait for it and have discussions with your neighbors about what they have as well, because she might also be in kind of a, like an island situation where, um, you know, she's surrounded by these non-native plant deserts essentially. So have a talk, have that talk with your neighbors that you might need to do. Okay. Um, a general comment for a novice like me, it would help to hear the common names of the plants. Um, yes, well, um, hmm. the problem with common names is that they're not specific. And so when somebody calls something a trout lily, that might mean something different to somebody else. And it might, these are not the, really the best way to go. Um, I know it's, it might sound better, but actually it's more informative to know the scientific names. It just, it gives you more information about genus and species. And then you can understand, you know, what family they're in and those plants in that family and all that, you know, it's just, it's more specific and it actually benefits you better because then you know exactly what you're getting. Um, fear not the Latin names. I mean, it's a, you just have to get comfortable with it and, um, you know, don't be afraid of them, but it's really a benefit to you to uh, use the botanical name. Thank you. Vivian posted a link to the plant list for the Gwinda garden. So it's posted in the chat for for people who are attending this talk. They can get a list of the plants there. Uh, do you have a similar plant list for the other gardens that people could look at? I believe so. The uh, Primrose Way Garden was on the Goey Native Garden Tour a couple of years ago. Okay. And so I think that plant list is available. Also at the gardens, uh, a lot of the plants are labeled. I wouldn't say all of them are because we're always adding them and I'm trying to keep up with the labeling. Um, but if you also go to um, uh, my Facebook pages or my Instagram, um, I'm always showing what's in the gardens, you know, what's on things. And um, those are easy to find. Um, okay. Some of the other talks I've given to uh, for the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency as well um, has, uh, you know, uh, great ideas for plants and things like that. Um, you know, if you start with those keystone shrubs and, and trees, you cannot go wrong. In fact, um, with so many plants, you know, you'll eventually end up wanting all of them. <laughs> Could, could, could we could we get a list of plants mentioned in this talk today? Um, boy, I suppose so. Yes. <laughs> you you had a sample design, you know. Yes, I do have that sample design, and if you look closely at it, so if you go back through my talk and yeah. pause it right on that and zoom in on that, written in very small letters, are a bunch of goodies um, that I would include in a, a beginning design. So, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Lyndon wants to know what zone are we in in San Jose? I don't know. <laughs> Isn't that awful? I don't know the zone. Uh, 
I yeah. actually Googled it and um, San Jose is in sunset zone 15 and USDA is zone 9 and 10, 9B and 10A. But I really don't know what all that means. So yeah, I don't e I don't either. I I go by what grows here to determine what to plant. Um, and then I, you know, I mean, we have so many great things that grow here. And on that Calscape website, um, you know, you can put in your particular location to see what grows in your location naturally and go with those and start start there. That's a great way to start. Um, and then, you know, maybe expand the search radius to see what grows in some of the surrounding areas. Um, you know, I have plants in um, all of the gardens that maybe are not exactly local, but things that I like to include um, because of their uh, habitat and ecosystem services. Thank you. Patty wants to know, did you change the soil or add anything to the to the soil? Nope. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. You just really don't have to do anything to the soil. Um, occasionally when I'm planting things, if the soil is complete clay and it's very difficult to work, I'll work in cactus mix just to make it a little bit more workable. But native plants really don't want uh, fertilizer. They don't want um, they don't really want compost. Sometimes, sometimes I'll give them a little top dressing, um, you know, but generally I don't really amend the soil at all. Teresa wants to know where can we buy annuals? And uh, there were a bunch of helpful responses posted. Um, one is our chapter nursery, Annie's annuals in Richmond. Um, Larner seeds for seeds. Um, Arvind, I have to interrupt though. We do not have annuals in our chapter nursery. So let's not. Uh, tell okay. That. Okay. Um, do you have any more to add? Yes. Um, so I search far and wide for seeds. And what I really like is called Seed Hunt. And um, that's pretty local too. Um, and I've also gotten seeds from other places. There's one, um, uh, I probably have it in my Instagram somewhere um, because I'm really experimenting with a lot of different kinds of growing things like bulbs from seed now, um, all planes, that's it. And so they had some, uh, some Fritillaria pluriflora, um, which is, uh, a great bulb that we have with a pink flower and I love pink flowers. So, um, and those seeds come from a uh, population up in Sonoma County. So not quite local, but I really, really want some pink flowers. So why not, you know? Excellent, thank you. Uh, some more mentions, Watershed Nursery. Um, a question from Francelle. What purpose do native wasps serve? Ah, native wasps. Well, so insects are basically the meals for other insects. And so wasps, um, some of them lay eggs in caterpillars that eat vegetables. Others of them uh, will attack and eat other insects and take them or take these dead insects back to their nest to feed their larvae. So they help maintain a healthy balance. They're basically predators in the environment. Because, um, I mean, the insect world is all about the mealtime and, you know, bees are the vegetarians. Most other insects are going to eat other insects. It's really, you know, it can be kind of scary sometimes. I once got a picture of a uh, wasp and I saw that it had something green and there was another wasp fighting over the head of a Katie did that had just been decapitated and they were like tug of war back and forth. And so that's what they do. That, that, that should get some folks interested. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, a question from Mike. Is San Jose open to creating similar pollinator corridors on public rights of way? That's a great question. Um, 
I would hope so. Um, you know, I would approach your parks and open space people to see, um, you know, what's available. If there's a parkway, kind of like the gardens that I did, um, that really look like they're not being used to their best purpose. You know, if they're growing grass there or ivy, you know, they're not making much more land here in Palo Alto and other places. It's like, why not um, enhance the the services that these places provide. It certainly has been really nice to be able to walk to these gardens during the pandemic when, you know, maybe you're not able to travel. You can still see, you can walk to five different pollinator gardens in the neighborhood, which is like so awesome. It's been, you know, that's a good selling point, you know, take it to the, take it to the elected officials and say that you want this. So how did you go about doing this for Palo Alto? You approached Parks and Rec or? I did. I mean, I really, I just thought, what's the worst that can happen? And, you know, it really did grow out of my own selfish desire because I wanted more space to plant things. I was I'm kind of out of room in my home garden. And the Primrose Way garden is 5,000 square feet and literally just like steps away from my house. And it was like, you know, really we can turn this into something better. And um, they were, the city has been so wonderful to work with. I just, you know, I, I was just so amazed. And it's great for them because they don't now, they no longer have to take care of these particular areas, which is another great thing for them because then that takes that away from their maintenance roles and it helps save the city some money. So that's a good thing for them. So win-win. Okay. Um, we have lots of, lots more questions. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna rush through them now. Uh, Tracy Noel wants to know, can you share again how the bees shake the stamen? How do they get the pollen off the? Oh, so in these particular stamens, they're called, they're porocidal. What that means is that they have pores in them. And to get the pollen out, um, out of these pores, they have to be vibrated at a certain frequency. And bumblebees are able to, with their flight muscles, um, uh, shake the pollen out. Um, honeybees can't do it. In fact, a lot of, um, of our food crops like blueberries and tomatoes are buzz pollinated. And so honeybees don't really help us with those. So if we didn't have native bees, we wouldn't have tomatoes. So that's how that's, that works. That's fascinating. Um, Christy wants to know the names of the two fragrant plants you mentioned. Yes. So. One plant that just smells so great is the white sage, that's a common name, um, or salvia apiana. Um, really a, just amazing kind of a spicy cinnamon floral scent to it that's just unbelievable. And the other one is verbena lilacina alamina. Um, I don't know that it really has a common name. Um, and that has, it, that one blooms almost all year long and has a little purple flower on it and it smells like verbena, of course, um, which is this nice kind of light sort of floral note. Um, and I was thinking when I was out at the, the Gwinda Street Garden the other day, and all of these gardens have a fragrance. And if you stand towards the back of the Gwinda Street Garden, you can smell it. And it's like, we should bottle this and make a perfume because it's so good. So those are, um, really worth planting just for that alone. Wonderful. Uh, Sue wants to know the common name for the plant that grows in a pot if we don't have room for an oak tree. Scrub oak. The scrub oak, yes, the little tiny bush-like oak. Um, it's a great plant in a pot. I, I need to root prune mine, take it out and prune the roots a little bit. But um, that plant, even though it's small, it gets chewed on, which is of course what it's there for. Um, and really just super easy. Wonderful. Lyndon wants to know, what did you do for the water needs at the Gwinda and Primrose Way Gardens? What role did the city play in providing water? It's great. So at the Primrose 
garden, there was already spray irrigation because there was a lawn. And so we just use the spray irrigation that's there. And um, they're set on timers and I keep track of how the plants are doing, whether they need more or less water. Um, all of these gardens have irrigation. Um, and, you know, I, I go out to each of these gardens at least once a week to check on the status of the plants, whether it looks like there's too much, not enough. If there's been some good rains and we turn it off. So far this year, we've gotten only about a third of the rain that we normally get. So um, the gardens are still being watered, which is why they look so lush and nice right now. Wonderful. Robin wants to know if you have limited room, is it better to plant more diversity or mass plantings of a few species? Huh. How do you stop at just a few plants, even with a small space? <laughs> this is always a problem. So um, I truly believe that you can cram a lot into a small space. I would get some of the backbone shrubs in there, something like Staphylus, which is our the common name, Manzanita, um, and use those as kind of like the backbone because they're keystone shrubs. And then um, put in things that um, will grow nicely underneath them, like bulbs, like um, uh, Dicolostema, some of the Tritileas that will die down during the uh, hot summer because they don't like water because they're bulbs and, you know, or the Calicortis, the Mariposa lily. Um, put some of those things. You can train vines to grow up into the shrub. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that you can do. Any like little spare piece of dirt, you can maybe stuck, stick in some Dudley is some of the succulents, some of the sedums that are really small. Um, you can really um, create a lot of diversity in these areas, but I would go with one uh, kind of a massive sort of uh, keystone shrub to kind of hold everything together, like the keystone, and then work in as much diversity as you can in that small area with smaller plants. Okay, thank you. Um... Do you, uh, Lee wants to know, do you have a favorite native ground cover for semi-shade that will attract bees? I like yarrow. Yarrow is a great plant. It's, you can walk on it. Um, it blooms nicely um, and it's a larval food source as well. And plus, um, I also like to plant bulbs into it in, and I think of yarrow as kind of having like sort of a matrix effect in the ground and it, you know, plants communicate under, underground. And I think that yarrow is kind of like the internet under there. And so other things like the bulbs can grow up through there and look really cool. Um, other plants that are maybe more herbaceous can go in there like delphiniums or buttercups, you know, things that are they come up and then they dry up and then they come back the next year, um, which is what herbaceous means. Um, so a ground cover is a good start, but you can actually plant into a ground cover and uh, create a lot of diversity, really cramming a lot of things into a single space. Awesome. It seems like layering is kind of a theme, right? You're either layering with shrubs and bulbs or you're layering with a thatch of you know, some kind of ground cover with bulbs and perennials, but trying to look at things not just kind of like as a full strata and how you can layer things. Right. It's a community of plants, essentially. You know, they don't like to be, I don't think that plants like to be by themselves. I think that they like to have their friends around them because their friends can tell them um, if there are predators and they can tell them if there are things going on in the environment rather than being all by their lonesome. You know, there's a community um, that, that evolves around the plants and they, they work things out um, as they do somehow. Thank you, Juanita. There are many more questions, but I don't think we're going to get to them all tonight. But I just want to say from my side that this is one of the most informative and engaging presentations I've seen. Thank you. I Over agree. to you, Stephanie. Yeah. Thank you very much, Arvind. That was a very well-led question and answer. And um, I really appreciate your talk tonight, Juanita. Thanks for everything that you've contributed and for the um, great information. I think we all took a whole bunch of new information from your talk. And I also agree, it's a great way to go out and 
see the gardens right now. You know, you can walk the sidewalks. And I think you also told me that there's a really nice walk you can do actually walking from garden to garden if you want to get a longer walk and get out of the house, inspire yes. yourself to plant some new plants. Absolutely. So, Yep, uh, with that, unless there's anything else anybody needs to contribute, I think we will wrap it up for the evening right oh. on time at nine o'clock. Can I make just one quick comment about for people, mm -hmm. if they want to save out the chat, they can do that themselves by going to that dot, 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 and then doing a safe chat, because I know there's so much interest, useful information in the chat. Right, so, some links to nurseries, and yeah, so just click on the three dots at the bottom, and right up there will give you a save chat option, so we will give it a few minutes for people to, to do that saving if they would like to. And um, thank you very much, Juanita, again. We really appreciate your time and enthusiasm tonight. And we will see you again, I'm sure. That would be great. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for joining tonight. And thanks to our team at CNPS who helped with tonight's talk as well. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time.